Hey everyone, Steven here, and today I'm reviewing the M32U monitor from Gigabyte. I released my short version review a week ago, and that just covered what I like, don't like, and gray area stuff. And this will include all of that, but I'll be covering the specs and most of the panel settings also. With that being said, let's get into the specs. The Gigabyte M32U is a 32-inch 4K IPS panel monitor with a 144Hz refresh rate and a 1 millisecond motion picture response time. This covers 90% of the DCI P3 color space and 123% of the sRGB color space. This has a 1000 to 1 contrast ratio and a typical brightness of 350 candelas per square meter or nits. This is VESA certified for HDR400 and has 10-bit color in the form of 8-bit color with frame rate control. Frame rate control manipulates pixels so they flash two alternating colors so quickly that you perceive any of the shades in the billion color experience. So this isn't true 10-bit color with a billion colors with this, but you're most likely not going to be able to tell unless you're dealing with a lot of HDR content or doing some editing with HDR. For ports, you will find one DP 1.4 port, two HDMI 2.1 ports, which will support next-gen consoles at 4K 120Hz with HDR. This is limited to 24 gigabytes per second bandwidth though, from what I've read, so just a heads up on that, but from what I've been able to tell, it doesn't limit consoles at all. You have one USB Type-C port, three USB 3.0 ports, and a headphone jack. The monitor has two 3 watt speakers, which I'll do a sound test for in a little bit. For mechanical adjustments, this has a height adjustment of 130 millimeters. It can swivel 30 degrees to the left or right, and it can tilt 5 degrees forward and 20 degrees backwards. This is VESA mount compatible with 100 millimeter by 100 millimeter patterns. Inside the box, you will find the power cable, HDMI cable, DP cable, USB expansion cable, and warranty card. Next, let's do a quick sound test for the speakers. My camera is roughly three to three and a half feet away from the monitor, which is my normal sitting distance. And I do adjust this in post to make sure the levels are as close to what the monitor sounds like in person when replaying this video. Next, let's look at the panel settings. The menu button is a single button on the right hand side, which I personally prefer, and you will find the KVM switch back here also. I'll be using images from the user manual to showcase the menu and some of the definitions. I won't showcase everything in the menu, but for things I can show video on that will actually translate to the camera, I will. For tabs, you will find gaming, picture, display, picture in picture slash picture by picture, system, language, save settings, and reset all. Starting with the gaming tab, and I do wanna note that at the top it will actually tell you certain settings that you are currently using. One of the things to note, I don't know why they have this in 1440p for the manual, if you check the resolution there up at the corner, but they do instead of 4K. But with this, you're gonna find aim stabilizer. So this function, when enabled, it reduces the motion blur in fast moving games. One of the things to note is this actually reduces the brightness of the monitor. You can do some minor adjustments both in the panel Panel and with the NVIDIA control panel, but overall it is very dim when compared to this being turned off. And essentially this is like extreme low motion blur, but you can have VSync enabled at the same time with this. 
This isn't something personally that I use. I just don't like when the monitor is that dim, but it is there. Next, we have black equalizer, which adjusts the brightness of black areas. I personally like it when monitors have this feature. Being able to adjust that depending on the game is really, really nice to have. After that, we have super resolution, which sharpens the low resolution images. With this one, another nice thing to have, but if you turn it all the way up, what I've noticed is it just makes certain things way too sharp. This could be good though for older games that may need some sharpness with it, where you can't actually adjust it in game. This just gives you another layer to do that. So I do like this. After that, you have display mode, which you can actually change the aspect ratio of this if you want to, nice thing to have. And then you have overdrive. And with this, for the overdrive settings, you have smart overdrive, picture quality, balanced, and speed. These are usually just named low, medium, and high. So different verbiage here, but with speed, you do get more inverse ghosting. So I don't use this. Balance has a small amount if you look for it, and picture quality doesn't have any at all. Um, personally, I've been using the smart overdrive, which I do like this option, and it's supposed to be variable overdrive without using NVIDIA's overpriced G-Sync module. I will have a link for a more in-depth look at the responsiveness when it comes to the refresh rate in the description for those that do want to look at that. I do want to point out though that your eye can only perceive so much of the information covered with an in-depth breakdown of response times, so just keep that in mind. I don't personally try to do all of those tests for my reviews because one, time limitations, and two, the fact that people's eyes won't notice a huge discernible difference with certain things. Now, of course, there are certain issues that would be very apparent when it comes to such things as ghosting, inverse ghosting, artifacts, flickering, and so on, but I cover what my eye can actually see here as a baseline. Now, some other larger channels that do these very in-depth reviews, I've actually reviewed some of the same monitors, and when they do their breakdowns, they may say one particular monitor has horrible response time, but does that translate to what you're seeing on screen in terms of the ghosting, the artifact, inverse ghosting, things like that? And when compared to another monitor that they may say, hey, this thing is really, really good, I can't discern a huge difference between the two. So I do like the channels that do those very in-depth reviews, but again, it goes back to what can your eye actually see? And when it comes to this monitor, there is still some ghosting here, but it is very, very minimal. I would have liked the one millisecond gray to gray response time. I don't think that's a huge issue that it doesn't have it because this is the one millisecond motion picture response time. But playing fast paced games, it's very smooth on this thing. Again, you're still gonna notice some ghosting, but it's not horrific with this. It's pretty minimal. But I think if you're a hardcore gamer, it may be something that your eye is more tuned into noticing those things. So with this, you may notice it a little bit more if you're coming from a one millisecond gray to gray response time monitor, but it's not something that is a huge standout where it's like, hey, this has horrible ghosting. But I do think it is something that you should be aware of before purchasing this. Next, we have the picture tab with our presets and then the three custom presets that you can set for yourself. Within this, you actually have different settings that you can adjust for each preset that I will talk about here in a second. But first, let's actually showcase each of these. And with this, the first one we have is standard, FPS, RTS slash RPG, movie, Reader, sRGB, and then our customs. Once you select one of these, you will find the different settings that you can adjust. You have brightness, contrast, six axis color, color vibrance, sharpness, gamma, color temperature, dynamic contrast ratio, local dimming, and then you can reset the picture. If you enable HDR, the picture tab changes over to HDR. And with that, you have light enhance and color enhance, which have three levels to them. And then you have dark enhance, which you can turn on and off and the local dimming, which you can turn on and off. The local dimming, by the way, can be enabled regardless of whether or not you're using HDR. So if you don't have HDR on, you can still use the local dimming if you want to. 
Next, you have the display tab, and here you can change the input, including the two HDMI, the DP port, but also the type C input if you're going to do that. You can also adjust the RGB PC range if you need to, otherwise it does it automatically. And you can enable overscan, which slightly enlarges the input image to hide the outermost edges of the image. And after this, we have the picture in picture and picture by picture settings. I'm going to leave this image up so you can read more on this if you want to. Pretty standard stuff here. After that, we have system. If there's anything in the system that you need to adjust, the one thing that I do like in that is that you can actually turn the standby light off. I like when monitors have that. I don't like that blue light just kind of constantly coming on and off when it is in standby mode. And this image right here will actually show you all the other settings you can change in this, like resolution indicator and stuff like that if you wanted to and then you have language save settings if you're going to actually just save this to a custom profile you get three with those so you can quickly swap between these if you needed to i don't ever do that and then reset all and that's actually going to wrap it up for the in panel settings here one last side note is you do have the option to download the OSD sidekick app if you want to control the panel settings with an app instead of through the panel itself Mine would never work, unfortunately, even after trying to workshop it for a while. I just couldn't get it to work. I don't know if it's my PC, but sorry I couldn't showcase this for everybody. So now that we've covered the panel settings, let's get into what I like about this monitor. The M32U, for me, checks almost all the boxes I want out of my personal monitor. So this, for me, right now, is actually top of my list for a monitor that I like. The 32-inch size is what I prefer. 27 inches to me just feels a little too small, and I really do love ultrawide monitors, but not everything displays in a 21 by 9 aspect ratio, especially when it comes to content. So the size here just feels great, and I love seeing more options in the 32 inch size, especially when it comes to 4K. 27 inches to me at 4K just seems a little bit of an overkill in terms of the resolution, while the 32 inches here feels like it actually displays that better. There is a 28 inch version of this monitor though, that is the M28U if you do prefer that size. Speaking of the resolution though, it looks incredible here and if you have a GPU that can handle 4K, this is the way to go. One of the things I don't hear a lot of people actually talk about, whether it's reviews or just talking about 4K in general, is that this actually smooths out the image quality to the point of not needing or at the very least being able to turn down the amount of anti-aliasing you need in games. Gaming on this monitor has been such an incredible experience. It's the first time I've not really wanted to go back to 1440p because the picture here is just so good. Now that's not to say that I don't notice a difference when I go from 1440p to 4K, I do, but it's not as big of a leap as going from 1080p to 1440p. Here, it actually feels like that leap is worth it from the games that I've played and now having a GPU that can actually handle that 4K resolution where I'm not sacrificing the FPS with this has been another big bump in why I think this is just the way to go because we have GPUs now, I have a 3080 that can actually pump out the FPS where you're playing those games and you're not dropping down 40, 60, 80 FPS just because you want to go to 4K. The IPS panel means lower contrast levels, but the panel settings here are great and allow for so many adjustments I haven't noticed any problems with black areas on screen or color banding like I have on other IPS panels. As I mentioned earlier, I love the single button for the menu here, and I think the in-panel settings and the options that you get with this are top-notch. It does give you a lot of different options here. The refresh rate is solid at 144Hz, and you have FreeSync Premium Pro here, and this allows for G-Sync compatibility mode. I've run this with G-Sync on and off without any issues, but I usually leave it on. The response time here isn't the fastest, but I think for most people it's going to be just fine. I personally noticed a little bit of ghosting, but overall I think this is pretty solid in terms of that responsiveness. It's not the worst ghosting I've seen, it's not the best, it just kind of fits right in the middle. And that actually translates to consoles as well. I did notice a little bit more ghosting when it came to the Xbox Series X. I think part of that is a hardware limitation there, because it's not going to be as good as my RTX 3080. But I like the fact that this works great with the consoles. This has the HDMI 2.1 port, so this is going to display the 4K 120 hertz natively. 
So no upscaling here. When you have a 1440p monitor, it usually upscales to that 4K signal. With this displaying naturally, it just looks a little bit better, obviously, than it would if it had to upscale. So this has run very, very smooth for the Xbox Series X. Still don't have my hands on a PlayStation 5, so I can't test that, but I can tell you for the Xbox, it runs great. Keep in mind, not every single Xbox game is actually optimized to do the 120 hertz. I've noticed certain games, it's saying it's displaying 120 hertz, but it's really not. And sometimes it's even just displaying the same frame twice. But for those that do have the 120 hertz, it does look really good. Next, the extra USB ports here are a huge plus for me. I've mentioned this with all my reviews. I just like being able to connect all my peripherals to my monitor because they usually run out on the back of my motherboard so huge plus there and this also has a usb type c input that you could actually use to help display another monitor or you could use it for quick charging next the kvm switch that's built in is something that i actually didn't realize i needed and that stands for keyboard video mouse and this actually gives you the ability to plug in a mouse and keyboard to the display and then use the usb type c cable to connect a laptop or an ipad or any type of tablet to this and then display that onto the monitor and i think that's awesome I'll have video pop up right now showcasing this feature with my laptop and notice the mouse doesn't work until I press the KVM switch to change over to the laptop. Now this is the laptop I use in my bedroom and now I want another one of these monitors because I could actually use this for a bigger screen. With this, I was able to run 4K at the 144 hertz with a USB Type-C 3.1 Gen cable, but my laptop only has an RTX 2070 in it, so 4K on this was kind of a bust when it came to more graphically demanding games like Doom Eternal. Running it at 1080p was fine though, which is actually what I'm showcasing here. It wasn't able to display this in 1440p for some reason. I don't know why there was kind of a breakdown with that. I can run 1440p at 144 hertz on the monitor from my laptop, but in that game, for some reason, it would never pop up. Now, right now, my camera is actually focused on the laptop the lenses and it's not focused on the monitor because it was having trouble staying focused on that. I don't know if it's the angle and the speed of the game. It just kept on trying to literally shift in and out of focus. So unfortunately right now it's just focused on the laptop, but I assure you that's just the camera doing that. The monitor looked fine. I was able to run Terraria in 4K with slightly less trouble, just it's not as graphically demanding, but it was still pretty apparent that there was stuttering going on. I even changed the settings to have just the M32U on and not my laptop screen, but it really didn't impact performance, unfortunately. At 1440p, it was slightly better, but again, this is just because of the hardware limitations here with my GPU in the laptop. I wasn't able to get the iPad or my iPhone to connect to this, unfortunately. It did say that you could do it with a tablet or a phone. I'm wondering if that is more based off an Android device versus an Apple device, though. I don't own any Android devices, so I couldn't test that out, so my apologies on that. But overall, I am pretty impressed with this feature, and I hope to actually see this on more monitors. Next, the speakers here are surprisingly good. They get louder than I thought they would, and they have a decent amount of bass. Most monitor speakers I've used in the past sound really flat, but this doesn't. So if you don't plan on getting external speakers, these will definitely be okay to use long term. And last is the price, which I think is what most people will be attracted to when it comes to this monitor, as it's much less than other monitors with similar specs on the market. This has a list price of $799, but I got mine for $739. It's currently on sale for $759 on Amazon, so the price seems to fluctuate a little bit here, but I've noticed it's usually on sale. Quick side note, if you ever do buy a monitor off of Amazon, make sure you check the manufacturer's spec sheet on it because Amazon's listings are usually wrong. The listing for this monitor says it's a one millisecond gray to gray response time and it's actually a one millisecond motion picture response time. This has actually happened with almost every single monitor that I've bought off of Amazon where there's usually one or two specs wrong. I don't know where there's a breakdown between the company sending Amazon these specs or if it's on the company side and they're sending just wrong specs, whatever's going on. It usually is something that I double check these specifications against the manufacturer's actual website listing on this just to make sure, but I did want to point that out for everybody. 
Next, let's move on to the negatives here, which I really just have one standout, which is the HDR. The HDR here is 8-bit plus frame rate control and not true 10-bit color, but honestly, your eye won't really tell the difference unless you are editing or viewing a lot of HDR content. It is certified HDR 400 by VESA, but at this price point, I would have liked to have seen 600 nits as the minimum, and from what I've been able to find, this actually has 16 local dimming zones. The local dimming here is okay, but it can't touch other monitors with hundreds of zones. With this, you can actually enable this without HDR being enabled also. So if you really do need HDR, I wouldn't get this as there are other monitors out there with better specs when it comes to that, but those do come with a much higher price tag. You don't enable HDR in the panel menu. You have to enable 10-bit color in the NVIDIA control panel and HDR in the Windows settings, which is different from other monitors I've used before. One of the things that I do like about the HDR is the subtle options that you have with the HDR in the panel menu settings. So to me, HDR really just feels like it's something that's been tacked on to this monitor. It doesn't feel like it's a main feature here. So if that's something you really need, I would definitely look at a different monitor other than this one. So now let's shift over to the gray area stuff, which are things you may or may not care about. Starting off with the aesthetics, which to me is for gamers really, and I personally like this look, but I don't think everyone will. This doesn't have any lighting on it also, which is a cool bonus if you need the lighting and it's there, but I don't personally care about lights on the monitor because that's not something you really actually see. Usually it's on the back and it kind of reflects off of a wall, but it's not something that you're highly aware of. Next, this is a flat panel and I've noticed there aren't many IPS or 4K monitors out there with curves. I already really like this monitor, but the one thing I think it's missing is a curve. I just prefer curved monitors. They feel more natural to my eyes. And although it's not a deal breaker by any means, this is a flat panel. And if you're coming from a curved monitor, it can be an adjustment going back to a panel that is flat. And that's actually going to be it for the gray area. That's actually a smaller section also, but a couple things I do want to cover because I know I will get questions about them. Text quality on this monitor is really good, both in game and writing. I rate all of my reviews on the monitors I'm reviewing and I haven't had any issues here at all. This looks really good. And last, Blacklight Bleed is here. It's very minimal, and I don't actually notice it affecting any of my games, especially the ones that are darker with this. And if I'm playing in a completely dark room, it's there, but it's not highly noticeable. So in conclusion, this is a great 4K monitor that checks a lot of the boxes you might need while not breaking the bank quite as much as other monitors with similar specs on the market. The one big thing to consider here is if you are needing a faster response time and better HDR, then this might not be right for you. I'll have a link for this monitor in the description if you want to pick it up. And if you have any questions about this, let me know in the comment section. Well, that's going to wrap it up for this one. If you liked the video, hit the like button for me. If you want to continue to follow along with all my content, hit the subscribe button for me. And as always, thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.